All right, so let's continue making forward progress on MP2, or actually just get started by uh, looking at one of the checkpoints. So as we always do, I'm gonna zero in on one test that I'm gonna work on. And this time I'm gonna look at the test that tests my load preferences method. So I'm gonna run this test. Now I haven't made any changes to MP2 yet, so I don't, don't expect this test to pass but I do expect it to fail and that'll give me a good starting point. And this is the test that I want to, to run over and over again. Um, one of the things that I would suggest as, as you learn how to become sort of an effective and efficient developer is finding a good rhythm. Sometimes I call this a workflow, like a series of actions that you take as you're working on something. Um, so for example, running the test suites is a pretty common activity. Um, it's running a little bit slow this first time and I think that'll speed up in the future. Um, so it's nice to have a way of doing this uh, conveniently, right? And uh, one of the ways that I can do that is actually by uh, hitting this play button. So you'll notice that when I run a test, Android Studio is smart enough to realize who's probably working on that, right? So it loads it up here in the run uh, configuration. And if I hit play, I can run that again. Or you see there's a keyboard shortcut. So if I hit Alt-Shift-R, I'm on Mac, but on your machine, it'll tell you the keyboard shortcut. I can run the test again. And so what's nice is that I can go over here and I can uh, go into my server code and I can work on my uh, load preferences method and I can just run the test suites again and again as I go, right? Without having to reopen the test file and scroll down. And sometimes if you need to understand what the test suites are doing, you have to read that code. So, th so that's sometimes unescapable. Um, okay, so let's look at what we need to do here. Now, this, in order to, to, to do this method, we really need to understand load restaurants. And so that's what we're gonna focus on here. We're gonna focus on what's happening in load restaurants. So this first piece of, uh, I'll just say it, it's sadness, um, is sort of the Java way of loading data from a file. Uh, and we don't really work with files much in this class. Um, this is one of the reasons <laughs> Java's not very good at it. Um, but you know, this, so what this is doing is it's loading information from a file and the file that it's loading is restaurants.csv. Now there's a convention in Java that things that go in a particular directory I can load uh, using this particular method. So this says get resources stream and you'll see that this file is in the resources directory. Um, so I can just take this piece of code and I can go ahead and just drop it right in here. Now, I need to modify it slightly uh, because instead of loading restaurants.csv, I want to load preferences.csv. And now what I would suggest we do is let's just print this uh, to make sure that I've been able to load the file properly. Um, and so again, I'll run the test again. I'll use my keyboard shortcut. Uh, that opens up the window automatically. The other thing too is these panes that are part of Android Studio, um, you usually want to close them rather than minimize them because then they open up the same size next time. Um, okay, so now I see that I'm seeing this information and this looks pretty similar to what's in preferences.csv. Uh, so that looks right to me. So it looks like I'm able to load the contents of that file into a string. Now the next thing that, um, that the uh, load restaurants does is it initializes this thing called a CSV reader builder that we're going to use to iterate through the, um, the, the string. And you know, this is an example where we could do this. We don't have to. Um, this particular file is set up in a way that's a little bit easier for us to parse on our own. So maybe that's what we'll do, right? Maybe we'll just get some practice with CSV parsing and we, and we won't actually use that class. Um, so what's in here are a series of records delimited by new lines. So what I can do is I can say for uh, string line in input.split uh, new line. Um, and then what I'll do is let's do system.out.println line. Uh, so I'm going through and I'm just trying to make sure I can go through that string and print the number of lines that are in it. And maybe what I'll do is I'll say, just for the purposes of counting, I'll create a variable here and I'll do i plus uh, plus line and then I'll do, whoop, gotta do i plus plus here. So I'm essentially kind of counting. And I could use a net regular for loop here too, but I'll just do it this way. So I'm running the tests again. Um, and I'm gonna see what happens. Now, you know, you might wonder like, do real developers run the tests all the time? Absolutely, like as much as possible, right? Make a small change, run the test. Make a small change, run the test. Sometimes you're just using the, the tests to run the method. That's okay, right? I'm not expecting the test to pass. I just wanted to do something, 
right? I want my code to run. I want load preferences to run. And this test is the way that I get that to happen. I could run the app and I could set this up to, but that's really slow. It takes a while for the emulator to start up. And so this is actually usually a good way to just run a method and see what happens. Okay, so now I'm counting and it looks like I'm pulling 45 lines out because I started at zero. And so it's never a bad idea to go back to my preferences file and just sanity check. And it looks like there's 45 lines in this file. So that's cool. Um, okay, so now I'm pulling out these strings and now each one of these strings is something that is uh, has a CSV data in it. So it's comma separated values, meaning that there are values and they're separated by commas. And so if I, if I want to get the parts of the string, what I can do is I can do line and I'll go ahead and trim it for good measure uh, dot split by, and now what I'll do is let's do uh, print the parts dot length. Uh, and we'll see, so what I'm doing is I'm taking the line, I'm splitting it into its different parts by commas, and I wanna see uh, if this is you know, gonna blow up or if it's, if it's gonna work. And this is another place where I would probably open up my preferences.csv and do some sanity checking here, right? Um, okay, so it looks like the first record should have 10. Well, that's a lot. I don't know if I wanna count that many, uh, but, but you could, you could go through here and you could count like one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so there are ten universal IDs. These are UUIDs. They're not supposed to be readable. They're supposed to be unique. So you might wonder, like, what is this thing? A unique identifier is something that's unique. The idea is that anyone on Earth can generate, so you can generate one on your computer and someone else can generate one. There's actually websites that will generate them for them. And they're supposed to be guaranteed to be unique. Now, is it a guarantee? No, it's a probabilistic claim because there is some tiny probability that two computers would generate the same unique identifier at two different times. But it's, these are so long that it's very unlikely that that's gonna happen. So we can treat them as if this is the only unique identifier on Earth that contains this particular piece of data. Okay, neat. Um, so, so this is, and this is how I would go. Now I'm gonna go back and I'm kinda gonna look at what's happening here. So I've sort of duplicated everything up till here. Um, but what I want to do is I want to create an array of JSON nodes. And I'm going to let you go through this method and take inspiration from it. So it creates, uh, it creates a, an array of JSON nodes using this particular syntax. Then it goes through the parts from the CSV reader. I'm doing things a little bit differently. I'm not using that helper method because I don't need to this time. The, the data is a little bit um, easier to work with. Um, and then for each line, I'm creating a node and I'm adding fields based on the data that I have in this, this array that I got from the CSV. Now here, what do we know about this data? So we know that in the preferences file, the first unique identifier in each line is the identifier of the person. So this is, each one of these contains a person ID um, and then all of the restaurants that they, that they like. Uh, and those restaurant IDs, some of them, not all of them, because some of them are bogus, but some of them map into the restaurant uh, restaurants.csv. So remember these IDs here? There are some in this that match. And we'll need, to, we'll need to be a little bit more careful about this in the future, but for now we don't need to worry uh, about filtering them out. We're just gonna take all of them. Um, okay, so what I can do is I can say, let's see, uh, string person, right? I could say string person ID is equal to parts zero. Uh, and then I could add this to my, my JSON node that I created and, and then I could proceed that way. And so you can use this as a guide. The only thing that's a little bit tricky is that uh, this, let's see here, parts zero goes into a field the same way that the cuisine and the name and the ID did. But everything else needs to be loaded into an array with the property restaurant IDs. And so this is where you go back to the lesson and look at that little walkthrough we did about how to work with um, arrays in Jackson, right? So how to construct JSON nodes, JSON objects that also contain an array as a property, right? So we walked through an example of how to do that. It's actually very similar to the code you need to write for this method. So, you know, anyway, this, this is how to proceed when you work on something like this. You know, use the test cases, use print the way that we always have, and just, you know, work incrementally, get a little bit done, you know, and, and then try to, so, so for example, you know, you might try just putting in the ID field first, 
and then run the test cases and see what happens. And the test cases will probably complain that you don't have a restaurant IDs field, but that's okay because that's what you expect, right? And then you can work on getting that field set up properly. Um, good luck on this. As always, if you need help, jump on the help site or ask on the forum. Uh, but you know, uh, you're off and running with MP2.